thank you very much. These are both uh, very interesting uh, projects and efforts, and I look forward to uh, having a further discussion on this. Um, I'd like to turn it to uh, North America and maybe just ask a couple questions uh, of our, our panelists there. Um, uh, Heather, maybe you would mind um, uh, telling us a little bit about the uh, project that uh, um, RTD in Denver has been associated with, uh, among others. I believe it's the Denver Union Station. Maybe you could say a couple words about that. Thanks, Sasha. Um, well, that was quite impressive, so I, I want to do that. Um, but uh, just to uh, talk a little bit about what we face in Colorado, and I'm assuming it's a lot of what a lot of transit agencies in North America face. Um, as a transit agency, we don't have the ability um, to do things like tax increment financing on our own. That's left to the local municipalities. We don't have the ability to buy land. Um, for the sake of development, we have to use it for transit-related purposes, those type of things. And as a lot of you know, uh, related to um, using federal funds, that's very restricted in, in what kind of private activity that you can then do on that property, although we've we've had some good conversations about how to work through that. So, so we do have a, a different set of um, circumstances than what we're seeing, um, but still within that, there's opportunities. And um, with those opportunities, of course, are the words that we've been hearing about through this conference, which is partnership and collaboration. Um, and so our project, Denver Union Station, um, was a $484 million project. We had four government partners, um, Colorado Department of Transportation, RTD, our Denver Regional Council for Governments, which is our MPO, um, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, and the City and County of Denver. And uh, that group got together, worked for a, a, a numerous years in putting this project together um, to redevelop a, a downtown area that was um, I would say quite blighted. I know I didn't like going down there. It wasn't a, a fun place to be. Um, so let me, I'm going to get through some of these to get to some pictures. So uh, if you can see this on the screen, this is what Denver Union Station looked like in 2006. So in the middle of the, the uh, picture is the actual old Denver Union Station that RTD owned and all that land surrounding it. Um, like I said, not a real good place to go um, on your own or at night, those type of things. Um, uh, but um, definitely had a vision, RTD and the other partners had a vision of how to make that a multimodal hub. Um, uh, the question was, how do we do that? And as you'll see, we got into the middle of this right during the recession. And so that was a little difficult. So uh, the partners got together, formed a transportation uh, or uh, an authority, basically a funding authority, uh, where the four members had voting members on it, um, and that particular body um, was able to cobble together 14 different funding sources. But the largest of those funding sources were a TIFI loan and a RIF loan through those programs at USDOT. Um, the largest repayment source of that was tax increment financing. So the idea was we developed this station, we put in a multimodal hub, and then the development will come. Um, but in order for that to happen, we had to back it by something, because at that time, um, this authority had no... Um, no history. Um, and so RTD issued bonds to pay our portion of the TIF back, um, uh, our, our portion of the TIFI loan and the um, RIF loan back. And then the city and county Denver, with their authority to do a tax increment financing, um, used that ability to then pay their portion back. So just to show you a little bit, again, that picture, let's go back here. Um, this is a picture in 2014 when we actually opened the um, bus concourse as well as the new uh, revitalized Denver Union Station, which now has a hotel in it, a boutique hotel, and it's quite, quite a lovely place to hang out. Um, and this is some of the development that's occurred. Since then, this is 2019, and I don't have a really good aerial shot, but that whole entire area has now been developed. Um, it took off after the recession. Again, it was a, a risky prospect at that time to some degree because of the economy. We were still in the recession at that point in time. Um, but there was a vision of what could be developed around there. And we hired a, a consortium that worked uh, from the private sector that was the developer that developed this land. Um, let me, whoop, I'm going the wrong direction here. 
So this is just what I wanted to show you. Um, uh, from the feasibility that was done, uh, the projections between 20, 2009 and 2019, um, you can see you know, between um, office buildings, square footage, commercial square footage, hotel and residential, and you can see what it actually turned out to be. And these numbers are of 2017, which is we have now all of those quadrants around there are completely developed, and I think there's only one parcel left under construction. So it not only proved itself out, but exceeded expectations so much that in 20, um, uh, early 2018, late 2017, we were able to pay off uh, the RIF and TIFI loans uh, 21 years early um, uh, because of the amount of revenue was there. So we finan refinanced our portion of it. We went from a uh, 21 years paying out $12 million to finance this project to that same period of time, we reduced our contribution in half. And then the city and county of Denver was able to take out their portion of the loan. We had to close all those at the same time. But it was all due to this um, huge amount of uh, development. And being able to capture the value of that, get the property and sales tax um, incremental amounts off of that. We did keep um, the... the um, uh, concern was the school districts. The school districts were kept whole as far as their amounts of money. I think that was mentioned in another session, if that's kind of important in some of these TIF deals um, when it involves especially property taxes. So it was widely successful, um, and we were all able to refinance our portions, pay off the loans, and then reinvest that money in other projects that both the city and county of Denver were doing as well as RTD. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Let's uh, turn to uh, turn the West Coast, uh, and uh, um, uh, Kevin Desmond will will. Um, you live in a beautiful city, uh, and um, there's a wonderful transit uh, agency there. What are you doing in terms of uh, uh, TOD, uh, both the agency and also uh, the community itself? Uh, well, thank you, Sasha, and good morning, everybody. And um, uh, great story, certainly, from, um, from Japan. And uh, like Heather, I think it's we want to do what you're doing <laughs> um, uh, as well. And I think we can learn here in North America a tremendous amount from our, our Asian uh, colleagues as it relates to um, joint development and realizing um, uh, revenue gains from, uh, from <coughs> properties. Uh, I want to tell a little bit of a story of, of what's going on in the, in the Vancouver region. I sort of think of it as really a virtuous cycle of, of success uh, as relates to property development uh, with some new directions um, coming in the works, but also some challenges um, as relates to that. So um, just first, um, just a little overview. Um, those of you who have not been to uh, Vancouver or used um, our system, uh, this is our SkyTrain network automated um, uh, rapid transit, some uh, 79 kilometers uh, of line. It was first built in, uh, in 1986, and we've been expanding it um, uh, in various different stages um, ever since. Uh, the blue line um, that curls around sort of uh, makes a, a curl was the original line. The yellow line, the, the Millennium line, uh, then came into uh, being in the, in, the later two, in the earlier 2000s, and the uh, uh, yellow line to the right uh, is our most recent extension um, uh, the Evergreen extension that opened in uh, late 2016. The north-south uh, lighter blue line is our Canada line, our P3 line. Uh, it was the first um, full P3 rapid transit uh, project in, in North America in 2009, opened just in time for the Winter of Olympics. Uh, you can see um, our new extension, our Broadway subway, six kilometer extension, that's the hatched yellow line to, uh, that goes um, uh, over to the left in Vancouver. And a project now um, under development um, would be 16 kilometers of SkyTrain extension, um, more or less into some urban uh, communities. In the context of this, um, uh, our, our SkyTrain network, we, we have about 400,000 or so daily boardings throughout uh, the SkyTrain network, is, is what I, coming from the United States, I've uh, was more recently in, in the Seattle region, I find is, is fairly astonishing uh, development along our SkyTrain network. This is a visual image of some 200 projects that are immediately adjacent to um, our infrastructure, to, uh, to the guideway. Uh, these are either projects that have been completed, that are under development, or in the planning phase of development. Some uh, 58 million square feet 
uh, of development uh, encompassed in all of these projects, which is, is basically twice um, the, the property in um, uh, downtown Vancouver by, by, square, uh, by square feet. Um, this just gives you a sense of what's going on in the development community around um, our system. And really notable in the upper uh, yellow line, our evergreen line. Again, this, this, this line just opened in late 2016, and the, the number of projects uh, that have been uh, completed or underway and the, the cranes uh, putting these high-density projects up along the lines at our station areas uh, is certainly, uh, certainly telling. Now, some of the story uh, of the Vancouver region and, and, and the property development in our, our stations, I want to start, <clears throat> excuse me, at, at this station in New Westminster. This was the original terminus uh, of, the, of the Expo line. This is actually a picture from some uh, 15 years ago, um, um, still two car trains. At that point in time, um, fairly modest development and actually a fairly rundown uh, neighborhood in, in uh, New Westminster. New Westminster, by the way, is where we have our uh, TransLink um, headquarters. Uh, then, uh, fast forward, a, a property, a private property development um, began a project um, uh, later on in, in that decade to fully envelop private development around that, uh, around that station. Um, and it's, they, they like to call it a, a transit village. There are three 30-tower um, uh, residential uh, buildings um, surrounding the, the station, right above the station at this point. Another uh, plus 30-story building is, is, is under development uh, right now. Uh, within it, in the station concourse, it's basically a mall um, in, in so many words. We have a Safeway supermarket, shops, a 10-screen um, uh, cinema. It's an example of how the private sector, the development community, saw the opportunity to help revitalize a downtown um, area, also make some money off the development and, and um, um, with the node being the transit station itself with tremendous access to all of the other regional um, uh, amenities um, in the greater Vancouver region. But really, the, the project that got the, the modern version of our transit-oriented development and development around the stations was this project, the Marine Drive Station. This is an image of the Canada Line Station uh, on Marine Drive in South Vancouver, right before uh, the Canada Line itself um, opened. You can see there's essentially uh, nothing there. A developer started a project um, at this station, which eventually became this, the Marine Drive um, uh, mixed-use development. What was notable about this development uh, was even as it was just a, a, the beginnings of a construction project, when the developer put uh, the housing units, the condos, um, on the market, they all sold out in four hours. And the overall development community took note of that. That was a first. That was something that, that really um, surprised people um, in the region and really began um, to get the development community to think about there's money to be made around our SkyTrain stations. Now, mind you as well, one of the hallmarks of, of our region in, in Vancouver is the very, very strong relationship between land use planning at the regional and local level and the transportation planning, where density is supposed to happen at our SkyTrain uh, stations, at our transit stations. This became the, the, the symbol of that and that, that the private developers could certainly make um, quite a bit of money um, on these, these projects. So I want to give some um, examples of some very uh, recent projects and what we think about now from a land value capture uh, perspective. First, the Capstan Way station. This is in the city of, of Richmond. This is more or less an artist uh, rendition. You can see it's a little bit hard to see off to the right um, is what is now um, what will be a station. This is a brownfield development. Uh, when Canaline was developed, the station was not there. It was more or less envisioned by the city of Richmond. But at the time, there was nothing there. There was no um, justification for building the station. Working with the city of Richmond, um, they are um, levying uh, what we call um, uh, 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 development cost charges um, at the station at about $8,500 um, per unit. They're collecting the funds to event to, to, that will privately finance this station in toto. It should be about a 35 to $40 million infill station. One of the complexities, this is along our P3 line, so we also, also have to negotiate uh, with the P3 um, developer. But it's an example of how we can use the development uplift, the land value uplift, 
permitted by the city of Richmond to help build a new transit asset. And the developer certainly sees that their development would not work. It would not pencil out without that transit station there. Another example of that is the Lincoln Station. This was on the, um, on the Evergreen line. This is now, this is, a, this is open. When the project was, um, the business case for the project was developed, um, this station, again, at, the, at that point in time was not justified. Uh, it was not funded in the project, but the offer was made to the city of Coquitlam, uh, where this station um, resides. If you want to fund a station, we'll build the station. So the city of Co uh, Coquitlam promised to raise the money um, in the future to put up, um, um, through private development, the, the station. And the same thing has happened. They are levying it through uh, community amen amenity charges uh, in the region with all of the new development. You can see the density around the station now that will eventually privately finance the station. Um, two other major developers put up cash. Uh, the mall owner adjacent to, um, uh, to this to this particular station also put up the cash. A couple of other stations that are under development right now, there are big holes in the ground, Brentwood and Lougheed um, uh, stations. Um, again, this is, we are supporting the project very much adjacent to our station. Um, each of the um, developers will provide different access, new access points to the station. Um, these projects are absolutely gargantuan. Um, over the next um, uh, 15 or 20 years as they are fully built out, they are expecting tens of thousands of new residents, which eventually bring new ridership uh, to our region. So, land value capture, uplift, where do we come in, where does this, this play into ultimately um, our finances? So our basic um, finances now at TransLink, we levy property tax, uh, uh, 22 cents per thousand uh, valuation of real estate. We've been using increasing property taxes to help finance um, our transit expansion. Um, we have also now begun to impose, uh, this will start in 2020, development cost charges. It's a new funding source um, uh, for new development um, throughout the region. Um, this was something that our mayors put in place to help finance expansion of the system. It's all throughout the system. It's not rel uh, uh, related specific to um, station areas. Um, at this point, we thought it would be better um, to levy it throughout the, the, the area. It's a way to get our, our foot in the door, as it were, with, with beginning to capture some of uh, the value from uh, development. Property disposition. In the past, we would basically just sell off surplus property. Uh, one of our major projects in 2017, uh, we did a lot of pre-development work for a, a former, a, a uh, discontinued used um, bus um, operating um, facility. Uh, we en ended up selling it for about $440 million. By doing the pre-development work with the city of Vancouver, we probably doubled the, um, the value of the property at the point at which we um, sold it off. Finally, commercial pro uh, uh, partnerships. We are working very closely with all these developers through our adjacent and integrated development um, program. You saw the map with all those boxes on it around the station areas um, to improve the station, the, the areas around the station with their developments. We also, um, I'm, I'm wearing my TransLink socks today. We sell, we sell um, <laughs> swag. I have to do my commercial for TransLink. But we do other things around our, our, our station areas. For example, we sell off dark fiber. Uh, through the, through the right-of-way. So I think what we need to start um, thinking about is how we can further capture some of these made the, the, uh, the revenue from these projects. We don't directly gather and, and, and benefit from um, these massive new developments. We get it from our transit ridership and is in point of fact fueling some of the dramatic growth in our ridership. The double-edged sword, two, two <coughs> things, I'll end with this. One, it's creating a lot of capacity issues in our system. And we need to be thinking about how can we, we, we work with developers, with the property owners, with the cities, to help support the added capacity in the system that's generated by these projects. Secondly, all these projects around our station area generally sell for about 20% higher than the overall market. So it helps to contribute to some of the affordability problems we have in our region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's very uh, illuminative. Um, we're at a transit conference, but we're talking about development, uh, real estate development, and each of these uh, speakers and presenters have talked about enormous projects that are happening in their, in their region, large, large projects. Um, I'd like to ask the, the members here how you as a transit agency, a transit corporation, a company dealing with transit, uh, manage real estate risk how do you think about risk? Because we're, we've been in a very prosperous 
decade, decade and a half. Uh, you mentioned Lehman, uh, but that's a, it's a, it's a distant uh, memory for many of us. Uh, how do you deal with uh, real estate risk? And also, how do you manage real estate, all the real estate activities? Because you have, a, you have trains to run. Uh, so maybe we'd, we'd start here. Uh, you first. Yes, please, please, yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, as for social background of Japan, uh, so the mortarization development uh, that was uh, the much later, so that the first the, the, the train, uh, the, the railway operation started, and then in the 1960s, motorization started to develop very rapidly. But prior to that, uh, the rail system uh, was in place. So in Japan, traditionally, uh, there have been the areas uh, the which are were developed uh, the surrounding or uh, around the uh, the uh, the stations, and then also that when it comes to real estate, uh, the value the closer to the uh, the station, uh, the higher the value is. And uh, we are the railway business, and also we are a private company. So uh, the railway business operators, first of all, we really need to uh, the run uh, the railway system uh, the stably and profitably, and we need to, at the we need to uh, the uh, add uh, the value in the area n around the stations. So uh, the. Uh, we try to do it at the same time so that the both uh, the railway and then real estate would uh, the increase in value together. By doing that, we can reduce the risk of real estate business. And we also uh, are doing a lot of development work in uh, the regional uh, the areas, not just Tokyo. And then in those uh, the regional cities, uh, the more uh, the automobiles were used for daily transportation, uh, so that the uh, the more uh, the movement uh, with uh, the automobiles rather than the railway. So. Uh, Together with municipal uh, the government, uh, we uh, try to have uh, the parking area near station, uh, so that uh, the, by doing so, encouraging uh, the people to use uh, railways. And in Akita, which uh, the, I introduced in my slide, uh, we. Uh, opened uh, the tourist information center and then also the sports uh, the facilities near a uh, station and in Nagano uh, you know there are, are a very famous temple right next very close to station uh, so uh, we uh, try to uh, have uh, the transportation system between station and this famous uh, the temple so that the more people use uh, the train uh, to visit uh, the the the, uh, the temple so that they try to increase value together uh, that would uh, reduce the risk uh, the, for uh, the real estate real estate development I just would like to add uh, the supplement at what mr. Murakami said uh, first Well, the gentrification will occur, so we how to incorporate that uh, with urban development uh, by municipal government. So not just the point, but we really have to think about as a linear way and then also an area-wide way. Uh, the model of TOD in Japan. Uh, that it's really based on the premise uh, that uh, population and the economy would grow. But once it reaches a certain level, we really have to compete at, uh, for at how much uh, the share we can get. So when uh, 
population uh, the declines, we really need to uh, the compact uh, the uh, the, uh, the development uh, the, so that the, uh, the we can uh, the deal with uh, the possible decline of uh, the population. They needed this. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned when we did our Tiffy and RIF loans, um, there was probably some hesitation um, because it was a new entity that had formed. Um, but in addition to that, we were um, just, well, I we're probably still in the recession when this part, when we were asking for money for this project and then pledging the incremental tax from uh, property and sales tax as a repayment on the Denver side. So one of the things we had to do was RTD actually issued our own tax exempt debt to um, promise to repay a portion of those TIFI and RIF loans. Um, we did end up paying quite a large credit risk premium on the RIF loan. Um, I think because of that uncertainty, uh, that was $28 million. Um, and then on top of that, Denver did pledge their kind of full faith and credit, um, uh, which cost them, because uh, we have to go to a vote to get uh, ability to issue um, uh, debt. So they, it cost them, they had to kind of hold that aside um, uh, to be able to do that. So. Uh, it's not as well ex accepted where we are as far as um, that, but I do think now that we have history with it, um, not only us, but other entities, um, I think also uh, in the future it will be easier to do those type of um, uh, transactions with um, the, the USDOT. Um, and, and they've proven to be quite successful. I think I would uh, echo, we didn't show it, but we have you know pictures along our rail lines um, where the development has happened. Um, and we just opened our G line, which was kind of a couple years late opening. But what was amazing when we went along that line and went for the, the initial um, train ride was the amount of development and in anticipation of that project coming. Um, areas of town that, again, um, were struggling, downtown areas um, of our smaller communities. And uh, the train has really brought um, life back to those areas. Um, I think one of the things we're struggling with um, that we keep hearing over again is how do we then, as we're talking about today, how do we capture that value as a transit agency and turn the mindset from us paying for those things and then that benefits the developer versus the developer doing things that then like you're doing in British Columbia of helping to pay for stations and things like that because it's a benefit to the community and the developer. It's not just transit coming in first and doing it. So I think that's where we're still struggling with it. Um, so I'll turn Thank it back. Um, so risk management is absolutely top of mind uh, for our board uh, and certainly for, for management and translink. We have a revolving land account. Um, as, as part of our financial structure. It's currently financed at, uh, I believe, $140 million. Uh, and through the revolving land account, uh, it's, it's our way where we can conventionally buy a property we need for future development, but we also have the uh, capability, the board authority, and in fact the legal authority to engage in strategic acquisitions of, of property, where we can in effect buy and sell properties. And the purpose of the revolving land account, therefore, is we buy a property, we eventually are able to dispose of it, it goes back in the revolving land account, hopefully we sell it at a profit, and you, have, you, you continue to be able to um, finance future development. Going forward in sort of the progression of how TransLink has used its, its property acquisitions, we went from simply buying and selling um, surplus properties to then, in, the, in our Oak Ridge example that I mentioned in my earlier remarks, we're now doing pre-development to the properties. We're now moving into um, a dimension where we want to start doing joint development um, as well. And therein lies the, the risk management um, challenge. It's one thing to speculate on the fir um, uh, future value of a property, and you know, in our region, that's not o overly risky as property values just keep going up, up, and up. But if we start getting into joint development projects, it, 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 it enters a different dimension, and that's very, very much top of mind. Um, our policymakers very much see the potential upside, however, <coughs> to actually developing these properties, but we will not do it solely. We will do it with partners in, in each and every case, um, whether it's for a one-time um, revenue that comes from the joint development or as a long-term income-producing um, property. Um, either way, we're going to look at the prospectus and, and try to identify what can bring that, that long-term um, income back to the system. 
in just the properties we control today, um, our folks believe there's something like half a billion dollars of revenue that we could capture from just a handful, frankly, of, of projects. The interest that our policymakers have is each new extension of our SkyTrain, our rapid transit network required, we have always had to go back out to taxpayers for, for another ask, more property tax or whatever. Let's start using development properties to help pay for these major extensions. Thank you. Good. We're going to open this up to um, the, the, the group here in a second. I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, so if you have some questions you want to uh, ask the presenters, I think there'll be mics uh, in <clears throat> different sections of, of, of the room. Um, one, one other issue that I think is uh, uh, I'd like to hear also uh, if it's an issue in Japan is around these uh, TODs, uh, there's gentrification, and there's issues about affordable housing. And while um, the agencies, transit agencies themselves, are not necessarily responsible for that, uh, it is an issue that we've seen in, in many areas. I'd like to get uh, your perspective on uh, how your agency or your organization deals with affordable housing issues or your, your community as well. Maybe I'll start with, with Kevin and, and, and go this way this time. Well, <clears throat> um, housing affordability is probably the number one public issue uh, in the Vancouver region. Any of you familiar with it? It's um, uh, the, the rapid escalation of housing prices through probably 2017 uh, was a major problem. It was chasing out young people, and there was a, a great um, fear um, of the sustainability of our region. Re recent policies imposed uh, the, by the province of, of British Columbia have sort of tamped down. Uh, the rapid escalation of housing prices. But absolutely, this is top of mind. The phenomenon of all that transit-oriented development around our, our um, stations, those were hot properties. Everyone wanted to buy them, so they, they, could, um, they could yield a premium on the sale price of something like 20%. Um, the downside of that, of course, is that's, that means that the, the, the housing is not as affordable to middle class uh, and lower um, buyers, and therefore, they have to move further out a field where we don't have as good um, public transportation. So we're working at something of, of cross purposes. Mm -hmm. So, and another problem is they were not building rental properties. And you know, the uh, prospectus for, for development is the real money is made on condos, not so much rental properties. So very much the cities, the municipalities have to begin to impose some, some different um, um, approaches to ensure that there's more rental. Um, rental property. As we get into joint development, to the extent that we can put our, our foot, uh, foot in the door, we're going to work with each of the municipalities and with the BC Housing uh, Department, Housing Minis uh, um, Agency, to, in some cases, we might have a property, we might sell the air rights, provide the air rights to BC Housing, um, and then they can, they can use that, that revenue to build um, affordable housing um, elsewhere. So there's different approaches that we can take, but the, the ultimately the affordability po policies uh, uh, start with the municipalities, not so much with TransLink, but as a matter of public policy, we need to start making sure that the properties at least that we can control have that kind of mix. So uh, I echo everything you just said. Um, we're having similar problems in, in Denver. Um, it's becoming quite unaffordable for anyone to live there. But along the rail stations in particular, um, uh, it's a very popular place to be quite high-end developments, those type of things. I will give you an example, um, and, and I do echo it. You know, we need to work with the municipalities because they're the ones that have that ability to dictate how much affordable housing's out there and those type of um, land use decisions. Um, however, a recent example, which is quite ironic, we had a developer who wants to build affordable housing right next to one of our rail stations. And so, um, but they needed parking because the city and county of Devel Denver requires so much parking to, to do a uh, apartment, um, affordable housing apartment complex. But literally, it was sitting on our rail line is where they wanted to build it. So we thought that was quite ironic. They wanted to use some of our parking spaces to, to satisfy Denver's need, um, the municipality's need for a parking requirement because our station wasn't being 100% used. So um, we couldn't give them the amount of parking they wanted um, because it would impact our customers and we had an issue with the private 
um, use of that facility. So we um, had a lot of meetings over a long period of time. Um, I met with City and County of Denver and we said, could you please, mm -hmm. you know, you're the one that wants this development, mm -hmm. could you please modify your parking requirements? And then this could be a win-win. Mm -hmm. So they actually, because mm -hmm. I said you're <laughs> literally on top of a transit station. <laughs> we want them to use transit, not drive a car. Mm -hmm. So um, so they, uh, we were able to work through a deal with them where we, Denver reduced the amount of parking required and we were able to satisfy their need uh, where they use the top level of our parking structure. They pay for that maintenance. So for us, we get the maintenance paid for for that structure in exchange for them using a certain number of parking spaces and hopefully having then a built-in uh, group of people that will now ride our system. Um, so that's, it's not a perfect solution, but it was a little, I felt a little step forward in that area, so. Great. Thank you. Uh, no. Uh, thank you for that question. I'd like you to remember how it is in Japan. I'd like to mention two points. The first thing is the difference between the Northwest and uh, North uh, America and also Japan is that uh, we do not have a massive population of wealthy uh, population. We have a larger population of middle class. and so. Uh, uh, we are uh, thinking about uh, working with the uh, government that uh, they have their own uh, housing policy and also, of course, that uh, uh, private companies can come in to uh, develop their own housing properties as well. Uh, so when we think about what can be solutions for housing, uh, I think that uh, municipality is the major actor for housing uh, policy. And also uh, what we can do as a, a private company is that uh, working with other companies who have their own uh, housing properties for their employees, uh, we work with them to convert those housing properties uh, limit in a limited manner for single mothers. And also uh, along our Tokyo lines, uh, we see so many uh, uh, public housing, uh, as apartments, and then so we uh, participate in renovating those properties uh, so that uh, those uh, older uh, apartment buildings can attract younger generations. And then also uh, when we think about uh, larger property uh, alongside of the stations, uh, not only directly into the stations, uh, we also offer bus services as well. So uh, those properties that can be accessible uh, by our bus services, uh, they can uh, have have an easy access to our transit uh, system. So uh, we are thinking about uh, not only the directly into the station areas, but at the same time, the bus areas as well. Uh, so uh, my comment is similar to uh, Yamaguchi-san as well. Uh, I talked about the Shinagawa development project, and of course we have to think about uh, uh, housing problems, but we have never been asked to include affordable housing options inside of the uh, Shinagawa development uh, project. Uh, rather uh, than looking at affordable housing, uh, we are more attracting international businesses and also international residents to come into uh, the Japanese property. So we are looking at luxury uh, property and then also maybe more attractions to the wealthy population. Uh, so I'd like to go back to why we started looking at wealthy population. Uh, in Japan, when we think about uh, truly uh, low income population and also maybe a uh, low middle income population. Uh, so those are uh, protected by the social uh, programs uh, provided by the municipality government and then also the national government. Uh, so I think that the social programs uh, provided by the government agencies are very strong. And also uh, when we think about uh, housing properties and also housing uh, projects, uh, those were limited or restricted uh, back in the uh, time when we were part of the uh, National Railway Company. So it sort of like has the uh, history of uh, not being able to proactively participate in a housing project. And uh, so when we think about uh, commuting to school and also work, of course, not immediate uh, downtown area, uh, a little bit cheaper or affordable. 
Uh, so we do not have any direct uh, participation into the housing policy, but by extending or running healthy uh, rail systems uh, so that people can commute to work and then also uh, school uh, safely and then also conveniently. Open up to the audience now. Uh, if you have some questions for the panel, there's uh, um, microphones there and over there. Um. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Kalala from Steer, uh, and uh, I wanted to thank the panel for a very, very interesting bringing out some very good examples, and also to talk about the differences between uh, Japan in U.S. and Canada. Um, the question I think I wanted to raise, which is sort of brought from what Heather and Kevin in particular brought out, is that in North America there is very much a restriction around the ability to do joint development or basically for transit companies to basically buy land to do development, which, unlike in Japan. Now, uh, when I was at Transport for London, one of the things that we were able to do successfully on Crossrail was to generate over a billion dollars in terms of development, either development, joint development, or in terms of capturing development near the stations. But of course, at the same time, the research shows that over that same 10-year period, the actual property values within a kilometer of the Crossrail stations has grown by more than 10 times that value. And most of that value is almost, at, at the moment, hasn't been able to be captured because for the simple reasons of it, people are not developing that land, they're just seeing an increase in their property value. Mm. So does the panel have an, any feelings or views about how we can, we're only counting a very, very small portion of the pie, how do we actually try to capture some of that windfall gain without obviously getting into all the other issues of other public services and basically, you know, uh, clawing back uh, value? What, what do you think? Okay. Thank you. You want to take a stab at that? Well, that's a hard one. Um, I think it goes back to something I talk about is for us a culture change. You know, the fact that um, because when those values go up, somebody's getting the benefit of those property tax and other things, and it tends in, in our area to be the counties. Um, there, but there's never been a conversation about sharing those dollars and putting those um, back into the transit system. Um, to be able to further that it would and, and, and then it's very um, parochial right so if that value comes from this particular county then I don't want to reinvest that money we, we I know in Colorado we had that issue with toll revenues if I, I want to know where those toll revenues are coming from so I can reinvest it in the toll rate in my area not benefiting the whole system so it's so not seeing it holistically that how transit can benefit everybody and um, so I think I, I think it's a difficult um, mm. conversation and it's definitely a culture shift and I think hearing about the things that are going on in other parts of the world and other countries is helpful because we can start opening up that dialogue I don't know how successful that dialogue will be but um, but at least having those conversations of, of how we can all benefit from this um, especially with an, an improved and uh, a transit system available. So, you know, in, uh, that's a very interesting question, and, and uh, clearly that would be a very difficult, um, I think, political challenge. The extent to which, if your property appreciates in value, it's still paper. So, I think it's at the if, if you were then selling your property after the fact, um, is there a new source of revenue or tax that might come from? Um, that appreciated uh, value. Now, we do pick some of that up since a lot of our funding at TransLink is property tax, although our, our, our increase, um, our annual increase is capped by, uh, by legislation. So we, we can't um, overly benefit, I suppose, um, from racing, um, increasing uh, property values. So I think the, the real focus is on the, the land, the new land, and the new development that's being, um, that's being created whether it's our new development cost charge, which is kind of a flat fee, or within the cities in our region that, that impose community amenity um, charges, which we don't have access to, but the cities gain a lot from that. And to a certain degree, they plow some of those revenues back into supportive um, features in their communities, and in some cases, they support access to our transit stations, which then turns into fair revenue for us. Great. So we have a chance for I think, one more question. Is there any? Would else like to ask a question of the panel? Um, yeah. 
yes. I'll go ahead. Um, Peter Rogoff with Sound Transit. We have a unique mandate from our state to make 80% of our surplus property available for affordable housing, which requires us to actually discount the property, which is not, not capturing value, but actually mm. foregoing value mm. um, in order to make those pencil out as affordable housing projects. But uh, to that end, I was just thinking about, Kevin, your, your, your revolving land fund. I'm not sure we, as a recipient of federal funds, would either, even be allowed to engage with that, even if we financed it with local dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering for, for you, who's worked under both the U.S. system and the Canadian system, and, and for Heather, you know, in order to maximize the opportunity for U.S. agencies to be able to engage in, in, in the most uh, opportunistic value capture, what would be sort of the area of federal rules you would seek to unwind, if there are any, to actually make it come together? Well, you know, just from, thank you for that question, Peter. I think from my perspective, what I've, what I've learned in my three years in, in Canada now is there, there's a greater reliance and willingness to, to partner with private sector dollars to build transit assets, whether it's P3s, which are far more common here in, in Canada than, than the United States, or our model of, of using properties. Um, to the extent to which that the, that the restrictions, whether at the local level with your transit agencies or at the federal level, have something to do with the risk of public dollars, because there is a risk, obviously, if you're engaging in, in land speculation. At least in our manifestation, it seems a really, really low risk. And if you manage, if you've got good policy governance around how those dollars um, are used and, and certain, uh, you know, I think boundaries with how they're, they're can, they can be used, there's a tremendous upside um, associated with it. If the extent to which local communities in the United States, you know, pull back from, well, a public transit agency buying and selling land and making a profit, that somehow that is viewed as, as, as just not the role of a public transit agency, I would look to Japan, I would look to Asia, I would look to Hong Kong. Everybody knows about Hong Kong's um, role in property development. It is fueled in really, really impressive transit. Um, expansion without going for new tax dollars. So uh, I, I don't know what rules specifically within U.S. DOT or in, your, in the local um, jurisdictions that can allow for that to change, but I would suggest it, it, there should be sort of an opening to that. It's not that big a risk, and there's a lot of upside. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're out of time now. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank, you, thank the panelists for, for attending and, and sharing their, their ideas, and I think there'll be some time afterwards to talk with them. Thank you very much.